With increasing desires to live at home for longer and have more control over one's healthcare, coupled with rises in smart technology use and affordability, the drive for healthcare smart homes from certain policymakers and technologists, particularly in rural communities, has heightened. These digitalised homes aim to enable older people to live independently at home for longer and potentially improve their well-being using smart and assistive technologies, such as remote health monitors, voice assistants and fall cords. In my PhD research, I utilised multiple ethnographic methods to explore the longer-term experiences of five older people and their wider caring networks living with smart and assistive devices at home. Simultaneously, the boundaries of the field in ethnographic research are not always clear at the outset. Instead, they emerge and are moulded as the data is encountered. This was clear in my research. As my time in the field continued, I began to see similarities between some of my own, own experiences and those of my research participants, and so the boundaries of the field became increasingly unclear. I offer a personal story on a missed opportunity for smart and assistive devices in rural areas, resulting in the death of my father at home in a rural area. Then I link this story to ongoing impacts on myself and my mum regarding our changing roles in the home, her, requir her requirement to learn new digital skills, and how these roles and skills continue to evolve. Finally, I offer some conclusions linking these discussions with the wi my wider research. So first to the personal story. In 2016, my parents both took early retirement and moved from an urban area of Belfast to a much more rural area within a small but somewhat remote town 30 miles south of Belfast. They had dreamed for years of retiring to the countryside and my dad had spent each day excitedly counting down the months until his retirement. In the, lead, in the year leading up to their move, my mum spent her evenings trawling the property pages and Google Maps looking at potential new homes. At that time, this was probably the limit of her digital engagement and they spent their weekends going to view houses. They probably would have moved to Scotland if it hadn't been for my dad's season ticket and an almost unhealthy obsession with Ulster Rugby. I remember on one occasion talking to him on the phone, and he sounded very unhappy at finding out there'd be a miscalculation from HR, and he would have to walk, work one extra month until his retirement. My mum had worked in a care home and my dad was a social worker, so they were both very aware of the problems and burdens within the health and social care sector but they settled on Newcastle County Down and moved there in the summer of 2016. Having previously lived in the same house for 26 years, this was a big deal for them. After moving, they spent their time doing up the house in the garden and walking their dog. Newcastle, where they moved to, lies at the foot of the Mourne Mountains and my dad had never climbed Slave Donard, the highest mountain in Northern Ireland. And so he was determined to do, the, do so before his 60th birthday. After a failed attempt, attempt in which we nearly lost the dog for good, my dad and I successfully summited it in September 2017, a few days before his 60th birthday. But shortly after this, things began to surely change. In Northern Ireland, when you reach the age of 60, you are offered not a cake or a telegram from the Queen, but a routine, routine bile screening. So my parents, parents sent off their screening samples in late 2017, and then my dad's results came back in 2018 with a query, and so he was sent in for a colonoscopy. The consultant told him that they had found small polyps, which is stage 1 cancer, and so he referred him to for an operation to remove them. There were multiple mix-ups with the types of procedure he was to be admitted for and a lack of information on pre-surgery requirements. For instance, he was required not to take his diabetes medication on the morning of the operation, but was not informed of this due to no pre-operation assess assessment. Finally, he was readmitted for the operation on the 6th of April. The polyps were larger than the scan had shown, and the surgery was more complicated than it initially expected, so a col colostomy bag was fitted. After this, my dad spent a week in hospital recovering. He was shown how to use the colostomy, colostomy bag. My mum, my mum, however, was not, as a staff member had visited earlier than, a, than it had been agreed with my mum when she was still at home. He hated this time in hospital and was frequently texting me to let me know this, he was discharged on Friday the 13th of April, ironically, even though he had been very poorly whilst he was in hospital and had even tripped over his slippers and fallen on the day he was let home. He spent 11 days recovering at home. This was a time of up and downs. He was glad to be home and was, in, was told in the first week that all the cancer had been removed via a call from the consultant. But at the same time, he and my mum had no visits from healthcare staff over the first weekend after his dis discharge, and he struggled to keep any food down due to this, due to being intubated in hospital and a colostomy bag frequently leaked, causing, his, causing him distress. He had to live downstairs, no doubt impacting his relationship with his home. 
During these 11 days, my parents had one visit from the colorectal nurse, but knowing how busy and overstretched they were, my dad did not want to bother them more with any concerns. At one, at one point, he even said to my mum, I don't think I'm going to survive this. When my mum called up the colorectal nurse for advice on the difficulties with eating and changing the bags, messages were not returned until the next day, and then she was told, Oh, this is all normal, it just takes time. The surgeon also gave similar advice over the phone, but as he had had diabetes, this was extra worrying for my parents. My mum also sought advice from the hospital dietitian, but her call was never returned. Then on the 24th of April, he became weaker. My mum had called the GP first thing that morning to request a home visit, but the GP receptionist could not confirm a time for the visit, saying, he is dealing with very ill patients, you know. My mum was keen to call an ambulance, but as they were due for this visit from the GP that day, my dad wanted to wait for him to visit first. When the GP finally arrived, he arranged for a rapid response nurse to come with an IV drip. The nurse was lovely and kind. I met her the, the following day when she visited after a shift to check on my mum. And this nurse administered the IV, but it was of no help. While she was working on him, my dad began to lose consciousness, at which point my mum was told to phone the ambulance. My dad, then, my dad then had a sudden cardiac arrest, but it took 40 minutes for any ambulance to arrive, no doubt, part, no doubt partly because of their more rural location, by which time there was nothing more that could be done. My dad did, died that day at home, age 60, and his funeral two days, two years to the day after his long-anticipated early retirement. I share this reflection not to invoke an emotional response, but to highlight how my personal experience of death and bereavement has and had impacted on my research. The story represents an example of a missed opportunity whereby smart and assistive devices could have had a more positive impact. I had now experienced firsthand that overburdened health services concerning the lack of home visits from my health from health professionals and unexpectedly long wait for the ambulance, particularly due to the real location of my parents' home. With hindsight, I was able to see just how useful certain smart and assistive devices could have been in this situation. For instance, a heart rate monitor may have highlighted inconsistencies in the readings and the ability to video conference healthcare professionals would have allowed healthcare staff to see my father face to face and then at least hopefully realise that his experience after leaving hospital was not normal. I had now lived experience through my dad to counter notions of a home as a good place to be ill or to recover, recover from illness, as is all, also argued by both Visser and Pollock. Ever since this experience, I have seen firsthand how my mum, brother and I have coped in the aftermath. I have observed, observed my mum becoming, being somewhat forced to become more familiar with smart devices and activities such as internet banking and emailing, things that, she used, that used to be my dad's responsibility. This distinction between roles in the home also linked to Stranger and Nichols' notion of the smart home and use of smart devices as a space for creating and amplifying gendered work and roles within the homes, in that the majority of technical jobs were undertaken by my dad. The importance of atten attempting to learn how to use new technologies before you are forced to, after the loss of a spouse, was also highlighted by some of my other research participants. In supporting my mum with this process, my role has often been to help her learn how to adopt and use new, use new smart devices and activities. I have often been the one to teach her, albeit mainly remotely from Scotland where I live, to teach her how to use smart, her smartphone and internet banking. Also since 2018, I have witnessed my mum taking on ever-increasing informal care duties for my uncle, but her brother, who lived with bipolar disorder. disorder. Informal care duties are multiple and wide-ranging. Within this role, she had to learn new digital skills, such as contact, contacting the housing officer via email, to provide better support and care for her brother. Similarly, as I also found from attending the Dementia Carers Group, this new role that my mum undertook was not one that is confined to certain shifts or hours of the day and started to become a full-time role. Also, my mum experienced additional and unexpected stress from this role, including extra cleaning of his home to make it hospital enough to entertain visits from professional staff and helping with logistical things like pensions from a distance, i.e. virtually, as her brother still lived in Belfast. More recently, this brother also passed away and I have watched her become, come to terms with this. My reflections so far have highlighted that caring networks can often take on multiple roles in smart technology use, being both recipient and receiver of care and support. Here, my mum was learning new digital skills for me, whilst at the same time using these skills to provide better care for her brother. 
This was also this also demonstrated by my key participant George as he received the daily care daily care in the form of a support check-in through his alarm system, but also offered technological and physical support to other older adults at his lunch club who were not as knowledgeable about technology as he was. I have also seen the great support that having a dog has been when living alone. Fergus, my mum's dog, was very useful in terms of maintaining a routine, routine getting her out of the house each day, as well as for just having something to care for and company at home. This importance was further emphasised after the loss of Fergus just before the COVID-19 lockdown, highlighting the potential for increased isolation and loneliness. Luckily, she has now rescued a new dog, Mabel, when the lockdown temporarily, temporarily eased in Northern Ireland in July 2020. Again, more positively, I've witnessed her build new routines and new social interactions by joining a choir, which was similar to my key participants' experiences of joining lunch clubs, shopping trips and poetry, poetry groups. I have seen similarities between the experiences of my mum and my key participants, their wider caring networks and the dementia carers group. In conclusion, I have highlighted how my experiences have both informed my wider research in terms of my petitionality and how these experiences have enabled me to better relate to some of the, my key participants and their wider caring networks in terms of shared experiences of grief, changing identities and roles and the impacts of rural living. I have highlighted the importance of exploring more beyond the more traditional data and boundaries of the field in ethnography, particularly within autoethnography accounts. This lived experience has allowed me an insight into some of the experiences also highlighted by my wider caring networks. In my PhD research, for instance, since the death of my dad, I have played a perhaps increasingly important role in my mum's identity regarding helping her to learn new digital skills and devices to complete tasks once undertaken by my dad. These skills are necessary for her maintaining the identity of a capable rural dwelling person. As such, this has meant that my relationship with my mum, as I mean part of her wider caring network, has become increasingly important as she navigates her new and evolving identity with some smart and assistive devices. Had my parents been able to utilise more smart and assistive devices, a different future may have been possible. For instance, there may have been there would have been better collection of my dad's health data in the weeks after leaving hospital, and as such, action could have been taken earlier.